Hello and welcome to the Admin Bar, the community that helps you streamline your processes, sharpen your skills, and demand higher paying projects. My name is Kyle Van Dusen from Ogle Web Design, just outside of... Ah, oh, shit. Okay, just outside of Fort Worth, Texas, and with me as always is my good buddy and co-host Matt Siebert from Matthew Siebert Design. How's it going today, Matt? It's going well. I, uh, I safely made it back from the, uh, the United States of Texas, and uh, as much as I miss it, it's good being home, although I did get a, uh, a pretty nasty head cold on that, uh, that ride back, so I'm still recovering from that. So I, I apologize if I sound uh, sick and snotty, because I am. I wish you would have gotten on a scale before you left and then after you came back to see how much uh, how much weight you put on eating food in Texas. Oh, for sure. I think uh, the next time I'm down there, I'll, I'll book one uh, one seat on the way down and two on the way up. <laughs> it's a good idea, actually. The the user experience for food in Texas is good, Pisha. So is. we're we're uh, we're joined here today by Pisha Neri again, once again on the admin bar. So hello and good morning, Pisha. How are you doing? Very well, very well. How are you all? Yes. We're good. we're doing Correct. awesome. Heck we're yeah. we're ready to get in here and start talking about some uh, some UX here. We were just having a little conversation before the recording started about a about a site we all took issue with, and I think <laughs> there's some threads on Facebook about that. But uh, just talking about UX in general, and I think today we're going to be talking quite a bit about uh, empathy within UX itself because I think that's a super interesting topic and Pisha is the queen of UX so we got the right person here. So for for everybody no or for people who don't know who you are yet Pisha why don't you introduce yourself to everybody here. So my name is Pisha Neri and I am Italian currently living in Spain but I lived in London UK for a long time almost to 20 years. So I am a designer. Uh, I used to be a designer for print, like Kyle and Matt. And, um, and then when I moved to the web via WordPress, I started getting really into uh, the UX process, which I had experimented when I was working for really big organizations. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, really, it's all about user experience. It's, it's a user experience is, is for digital products or for products in general and what we're building on the web really uh, is products so I started thinking how can we smaller people use the process because everybody thinks like it's a big uh, it's mostly for big organizations but I really don't think it is I think it's absolutely essential it has to start from there so I've been really concentrating on UX for quite a while now that's why Kyle gives me all these lofty titles that I doubt I deserve. <laughs> oh, they get, give me really big imposter syndrome. But it is true that I have been working quite hard to, to create a process for me. And I'm also now sharing it uh, with others because I firmly, firmly believe that a good user experience is everything. I mean, what, what is a website without or, a, or an app or any product without user experience? It just doesn't exist. It's so unusable. Literally unusable. That's the word usable would open a whole new conversation. But yeah, because user experience used to be mostly about how usable things were. And then the uh, the attention was shifted also on the fact that you can make things that are usable and yet they may be ugly or give no pleasure. And, you know, enter emotions, which are now considered a very important part of user experience anyway that's that's who i am <laughs> well i think uh you know being introduced to you and joining your group which i'll put a link in the show notes to your group so people can check that out but i think uh you know ux and ui they you know they always kind of get used together and i think people they're like these fancy titles people want to use in a big agency and like oh i'm just a ux designer and and it's almost something that like seems like fluff or uh, the, the way it's used seems that way. But I think its actual importance is, is 
uh, can't be understated. And we're already doing a lot of UX work, whether we realize it or not. Like if you're developing or designing a website or like most of us doing both, you're dealing with UX constantly. You just might not be labeling it as UX. And one thing that you've really opened my eyes up to in the group is just UX all around us. So everything we deal with has some level of user experience. And I know there's been like uh, lots of examples in your group of um, different things that come up just in day to day life uh, about, you know, uh, how we kind of navigate through the world and kind of looking at that through a UX lens and being able to do that because it was something I was more familiar with, I think has opened my eyes to being able to understand how it works within my websites more. So I'm thinking more about how people are going to use it. What's their intention? Uh, where could they get confused? How can I help them through this process? So uh, I do appreciate that very much. And, and it's just been something I've thought about a whole lot more recently. Yes, and you said something that's, uh, in, you said many things that I could. I did say I could many things. Of I've been accused of that before. <laughs> there are so many threads hanging from what you said, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to pick the first one here, which is that uh, the UX professional kind of thing. And without a doubt, if you go in a big organization, there are dozens of different types of UX pros, and I'm keeping it to UX, and we'll talk about what UI is and how it relates to UX. But anyway, so many different, you can be a UX researcher, you can be a UX uh, designer, you can be uh, so many different things. And I think that that's the main thing. It's, it, that's a, a problem for the small agency or the freelance or the solo you know, worker, developer, designer who think, I can't be, I, UX is nothing to do with me because it's something that you need to be a professional, a UX something to be able to do. And if you go and find and look at courses, that's what they teach you. They generally teach you to become one type or another of UX professional. They'll give you an overview of what UX is. And then you'll say, they'll say, okay, and to be a UX designer, do this, to be a UX uh, a researcher, because you could never touch design at all and just be a researcher, do that. And uh, that's the point that, it, makes people not want to go into it and that's a real shame that and that's kind of the kind of education that I'm trying to give because really it's it's not like that and like you were saying you guys already are doing so much UX and the stuff that you publish in your and post and talk about in your group and other groups groups that we all frequent it's UX basically it's anytime you give a client a questionnaire to fill so that you find out more about their business and work out what their needs are. You're doing UX. That's 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 what it is. So I think they're just understanding what it is and creating a framework for it that anyone can use is is uh, great fun. I'm 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 really enjoying doing that. But as you were saying, now the UX lens um, uh, I take everywhere I go, and sometimes it's kind of funny, sometimes it's a bit ridiculous. But in all cases you get, I think, a very good eye at working out whether the business that's doing something that you're experiencing is thinking about their needs first, the business's needs, or their users' needs. To me, that it's the bottom line. And actually today, because there's, um, I follow a few uh, UX people on Twitter, and someone uh, quoted today a Zig Ziglar quote. For those who don't know, Zig Ziglar is a super famous kind of marketing guru from old times though. And the quote is very simple. It says, if you help enough people get what they want, you will get what you want. That's it. It's like, that's UX in a nutshell. That's all it is. Even if, so you can strive to do this in any way you can think of, or you can, you can have a system to do it, which usually is preferable because it's what you guys do. You, you get system, you teach people, you help people get their own systems is what you do like the genius um, website owner manual, which is <laughs> wonderful bait, client bait. It's amazing. Amazing. You can go it's to getthewom.com and purchase your own copy right now. <laughs> yeah, and kind of like, uh, like what you had said is that the, uh, you know, the goals for the, the business and the goals for the user are, I mean, really the, 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 the ultimate ending is the same. You know, they're, they're coming at it at different directions, but you know, you need to help both, you know, you, your, your client and the, uh, and the end user, but in doing that and, you know, 
creating good UI, good UX, like you're going to be guiding the uh, the customers or clients or whoever's visiting the uh, the sites to the goal of the client. So they they definitely are one and the same, or at least very very much overlap. Yeah, and I, 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 as you were talking a second ago, Pisha, I was thinking I just I posted a thread last Friday as I ended my day Friday. I had a client who I sent like the first draft of their website to them, and their <laughs> their comment was that they wanted their logo bigger in the header. Of course, okay, um, love it. And then they wanted to replace in like the hero section on the homepage. I had like an H1 title, like this is what they do because I don't think it's super clear when you land on their page uh, because their content is crap. Uh, but they wanted to replace that H1 with another copy of their logo, just way bigger. And uh, yeah, I don't think that really, uh, th that's not going to be very good user experience for their users to hop on and just see giant logos. I mean, I think they're thinking of themselves and not thinking of the users. I wish I would have thought of uh, explaining it that way instead of my hasty email I sent back. Didn't but, they? Uh, didn't they also request you take uh, off all of the CTAs on that that site? Yes, yes, they wanted to get rid of all the CTAs. Yes. Oh God, I mean, client education is a whole new. It's a whole, you know, section in it, in itself. There's, but um, uh, funny enough, they, they make the logo bigger, which is really it's almost hilariously cliched. But still, they yeah. still say it. It's something. So the very first talk that I gave was a talk about Gestalt uh, psychology of vision. There's Gestalt psychology th that is therapy, psych it's psychotherapy. But there's also the psychology of vision, which is what in interests designers. And that's so one of the things that I said in that talk that I say in that talk is um, this is how you get your clients to stop saying make the logo bigger because you get you have an arsenal of really good answers that you can say no if I do that then your client will not go to the next step that you want where you want them to go and therefore they won't buy from you I, I know it obviously sure. depends on the but that's it so the point is, I mean, client education is such a big thing, and uh, and especially for as regards UX. So I think that my um, recommendation is often to just not even mention UX because they will just get scared. You just do it fundamentally. But but the, I mean, this one, this case in particular, Carol, sounds quite a tough one. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's <fun>. like. <laughs> So I'm wondering whether, as you were saying that, because you're such masters of, you know, sys grid team systems and so on, whether there should be an onboarding thing that we all have that says, uh, explains what a website should do. And I mean, I, I think that they wouldn't read it necessarily, but whether somehow there's a way or whether we just leave it and, and not do it. But I mean, it's something that just happened to me recently with a really, really big project, big, big project um that i was getting on a, as a consultant on but they this big organization didn't really understand it so basically it's not the ux bit is not happening anymore because it, they're just scared of it they don't understand what it is so sometimes it's better to not say it because if you don't say it and you do it anyway you know you're going to do a better job anyway mm -hmm. and right. and and so what's the point you know it, it you just you just do it because well, you, you know, the process can be as long as there's a framework that you can use and you can stretch it as long as you need to, depending on the budget. And you can do it in three hours, but at least you do it. Well, and, because and I was frustrated, I just made two giant logos on their homepage and sent it back to Did you? Them. I'd love to see it. <laughs> no, I'm not it, sure it, as funny as that is, sometimes, sometimes it is a visual thing and the, the client just needs to see the difference like what they have yeah. in their mind and they think is right you know as soon as you do it and you show it to them they're like oh yeah okay i totally understand this i don't yeah, know if go that's back to what with... you had before right yeah but exactly. that's what's frustrating that's the typical thing where you go yeah but that's where you should trust me and right. and know that you, in an ideal world we would tell them and they would say yeah right don't you know i trust you but as we know not all clients are like that yeah. So we, we kind of talked about how we're 
how we can look at UX in a lot of things. And, you know, a lot of us are solopreneurs or very small teams and, and UX is going to be a portion of what we're doing for clients, but we also have to wear, you know, a thousand other hats. We're also doing billing and onboarding and uh, designing and everything else. So uh, you teach a course about UX. Uh, what, what kinds of things should we be looking at that we can easily adapt into our processes to, to give better UX without having to, turn our entire focus to only thinking about that well that's the beauty of it because it's actually it's 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 a process that just integrates it's not there's nothing it's not like you then just concentrate on that no it's the opposite it gives you it gives you a tighter structure and it, it's actually kind of a business structure as well and it's just the way of of carrying out the build that integrates ux into it make by making things easier basically because in in really simple words it's it's uh the way i've structured it is i based it on design thinking which is a thoughts process methodology that's based on uh giving the humans that use your sites your products the best experience possible so um it's actually a bit more complex of that but I'll, I'll leave it i'll leave it to that and uh design thinking has five faces now i think that five faces is a bit too long so i distilled it down in into three phases but fundamentally you do the same things so the first one is called research and that's where you talk to uh, the client and their users as much as possible and you define their problem it's same as marketing there are so many processes that overlap anyway so you, we kind of do it already but you basically you then get to the definition of the problem. That's where the research phase ends. Then in, from research, you, you move to design. That's the second phase. And in a design phase, you, uh, you find a solution to a problem, basically. But you integrate it. You just don't, because one thing that I see happen a lot is that marketing is completely separated from design and SEO is completely separating from design and copywriting is completely separated. So the aim is also to, make it all go in together because you were saying, you know, the content of your clients is not great. So mm -hmm. that's also something else. If you do it this way, then you never do a Laura Mipsum website ever again. You, you, because if you don't know the content, how can you help the user? What's the point of the website? Then really just get a theme and copy it, just get a template and copy I've, it. I've been having it's, this argument. It's fine. I've been having yeah. this argument over and over again with people talking about, you know, content first or design first. And, and I've been for the last several years designing websites with no content and being really frustrated about it. And finally, when that light bulb came on of like, you know, the purpose of me designing something is to communicate your message. If I don't know what the message is, there's no design that solves the problem. I'm just making you a, a custom website template uh, that has nothing to do with your needs at all. Yeah, and what's funny Absolutely. is that I uh, Kyle and I both, and Pisha, like we all come from a design background, and even even so, like I know myself and Kyle just said, like we were designing sites, you know, without copy first, and then you know just waiting on a copy, and oh, nice. that process is just absolutely terrible. But you know, if somebody came to either one of us and asked us to create a show poster or a trifold, and they didn't have any copy. Or images. Or... There's literally nothing no, that we can do. It. So why is it that people start uh, building sites before they have the copy? I mean, visually. Because we never had templates. I mean, did you ever do a, a, a film poster on a template? I didn't never. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dream of it. It just exactly. didn't exist. Yeah. Right. So, so that's, I mean, that's it's, one. it's copy first for sure. Absolutely. And uh, Kyle, to pick on, on something that you said, you said, I need to get your message out. And that's where it changes with UX because with UX, then you start thinking, okay, wait a minute, is your message your message, the business's message, or is it something that's really useful for the people using your site? So I guess that that's the mentality shift because as much as we are all doing a form of UX, but that's a really, really big mentality shift. And I think it's the most important mentality shift that the clients need to make, that it, it, you need to, either get them to understand or do it anyway by stealth sometimes and um 
because that's 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 it. You don't do it for your own. Don't do the best for your business. Do the best for your users, and that will be the best for your business. And I yeah, think and that those. You, yeah. you talked about like research being the first phase of that. And I think that's yeah. where a lot of us, uh, we we fail to do the research first because we're excited to get in there and start designing something and making something and all that. And what happens is your your design process and your proofing process and getting the, the site to launch takes 10 times as long because you didn't do that research. Now you're having to uh, put out solutions there without any basis and then go back and do the research to try to fix all these. It just... It kills everything if you don't start with that research first. You know, and I, I, to add to that, I think that the reason that people do that is because, you know, the visual pieces are one, probably a whole lot more fun for you as the, uh, the designer or the developer, but it's also the piece that typically throughout the process of building the site before launch, it's what you're going to get the kudos for from the client. Like they're going to make you great. feel good about the thing that you've created that looks pretty. You know, they're not going to see anything on the back end that you're doing. You're not, they're not going to see the, uh, you know, the, the, the SEO and the marketing and, and all of that necessarily until after it's launched. And then they start seeing the, uh, the results of the actual project. But it, you know, it's, it's difficult to wait for those, uh, those like, you know, feel good moments. So people just rush yeah. right into the design part. Absolutely. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's really difficult to quantify it. That's the whole point. And it's often something that people are asked to, you know, UX people are asked to quantify UX and it's really hard to do that. So that's why, but, but the, the, the research, back to what you were saying, the research bit is where you determine the strategy. So it's absolutely essential. And I guess that then it comes to a point where if a client really doesn't understand that they need a strategy, just give them a brochure website. Either decide that you don't want to deal with that kind of client anymore or just give them a brochure website and that's it. But I'll, t I'll give you a few more reasons why UX is a good idea and a few more strategies on how to make that accepted. So the first thing is that when you use the UX process, as you were saying, instead of... Um, it's sort of related to what both of you were saying in, 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 in a way, because one way that I prefer to work now is to actually deliver a website that may not be perfect when it comes out, but you, that you keep tweaking and optimizing once it's out because you do that based on, on real data and what people really want, because Absolutely. you can do as many tests as you like before, but it's never going to be perfect anyway. So that gratification moment is actually even more delayed. But I have got a solution for that because let's not forget that I, like you, I mean, I completely, I mean, we used to do printed stuff. I mean, I used to, you know, books. Oh my God. And I actually, I want to do books again because it would be lovely to have an op. It's, how nice is it when you get the object back? But it was a completely different uh, mentality. And it's unthinkable for us to get something out that isn't perfect. Hmm. God forbid, it's like, because you can't, you know, if you if it's a 10,000 copy sprint run, you and it has to be out on the, on the day of an exhibition, it's a disaster if it's not perfect. So I think that we need to reprogram our heads from that. And actually what I recommend now is to get it done, get it out and then perfect it. And if some websites don't sell anything, if it's a brochure that is the equivalent of a, of a printed brochure online, then do it like that. I doubt that any site should be like that. I just, I really doubt it. But some people don't get it. Okay, let's give it. Uh, yeah, that's the problem. It. Some clients don't understand that but it can even, do so much more. I know, but even in that case, I'll put it to you that you still need to get the content first because that's going to make you so much more profitable. Mm -hmm. And it's it, this is a kind of, it's an A side from my, my spiel, if I may, but it's really relevant for your audience uh, there's a friend of mine well, well it's someone um, that you might know wendy uh uh of the unpronounceable surname she's quite famous in uh, in the wordpress environment but she just gave a talk at uh, work in valencia here where i where i live because she runs a very successful wordpress business working mostly with small clients who with small budgets who don't, if you told them about UX, they wouldn't know. But she's got a system in place that is so tight that she never starts a job before she gets the content. And 
wait for it, hold on to your seats. She never has a contract and never gets a deposit. And this may horrify us, but she has a very, very good point and she's very successful. So that means that, you know, it works. I think she would be actually, by the way, a really good, good um, <laughs> guest. But apart from that, the fact is that then she gets the content, she gets it because otherwise the website doesn't come out and she gets content that she, she guides the client. So it's their job then to do it in the best possible way for them. But as a strategy, whatever, you know, apart from everything else, but getting the content first has to be it. We, we really should train ourselves to just go, right, great. You want a website, fantastic. Get them through a process, onboard them, whatever, and just say, right, now I'm going to wait for the content. And that's it. And you say, do you want, if you want help with the content, we can help. But basically, I'm not going to touch anything until I get the content. And, and actually, I, I'm now thinking, yeah, that is not a bad idea to not get <laughs> A deposit until you get the content because I am now in a situation where someone paid me up front months and months ago there's nothing there and I'm still going to have to produce the website because I actually didn't put the clause that everybody should have that says if the project is off you know is uh, or dormant for too long then there's a restart fee and that's the only contract this year where I didn't put that clause I don't know why so <laughs> It's, it's better. It is better for them and for you because ultimately, again, we're trying to do whatever is best for everybody. Anyway, that took me quite on the wayside, but you know, I always digress. So it had well, to happen. You're good. So we kind of talked about your three-step kind of approach to this and it being uh, research yes. and then design. And then I think we kind of got into the third step, but I don't think we labeled it. So let's talk about that. Uh, and make sure yes. we we get all three for everybody. You, it's validation, aka testing. And the point is that it's not it's not a linear process. You go back and forth f between the stages. You have to have a solid foundation fundamentally, but you will maybe go back to the beginning from the testing because it's something that comes out from real use that you hadn't considered. That's absolutely normal, but that's why it's much better to get a pro product out that is not perfect because it cannot be perfect. Let's let's forget about that. It's not going to be perfect. It, it will never be perfect. And as soon as you think it's perfect, something in the world changes and it's no longer perfect anymore. Absolutely. Of course, of course. That's why it's so stressful for me to have my own websites because it's like, uh, I know that occasion I have to go back to them and it's like, uh, yeah. But, but that's, so that's the, and that's where also the recurring revenue opportunity comes in. Because if you train clients to say, look, let's do half, you know, the, the budget that you had in mind, let's do half that and spend more over the course of the next year. Because every month you give me a chunk of money that I will use to optimize and build new pages as the need arises. It's a mentality shift, but it's a really, it's the best one for us because it's less work lacks concentrated work, more work, uh, more ongoing revenue, plus the kind of certainty that you're going to give them something that works better for them. Because also they will understand their needs better, their own needs better as they test and so on. There's even um, HubSpot have a course called uh, Growth Driven Design, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, which is basically, that's the premise. It's a very short course, but it's like, a, the, that's the premise. The premise that is that do the a bunch of research, then implement, you know, work in prototype and then uh, go back and optimize it. And I think you actually kind of sound more confident going into a, a proposal or some kind of meeting with the client saying like, listen, I don't have all the answers for you you don't have all the answers and nobody else in the world has all the answers to know exactly what's going to work for you. But I do know if we follow this process, we'll get to all those answers, you know? So I think that's, that's certainly a, a, a great working idea. Right. Cause I mean, ultimately yeah. the users are going to tell you those answers, you know, like in Absolutely. testing and in watching how they, they, you know, progress through the site, like what kind of flows they're doing, like that's going to show you what you need to change. And the only way you're going to do that is on a live site. So yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I think it gives them kind of that, uh, uh, like a surety too, that, um, you know, I think everybody has the fear. Well, what if I spend all this money and the website doesn't work and then I'm Precisely. just stuck with right. it? Well, that, you, you eliminate that if you, if you put in some kind of 
uh, iterations into the website into the future. So we're going to every month look at this and this and this, and we're going to work on these things. Then you're really reducing the risk your client has of them paying a bunch of money for something that doesn't produce results. And they know that you're going to, you're going to stay invested in them, you know, and that's, that's so important to a client. Yeah, because then you're really invested in their success as well. Exactly. And and that's also that's where I want to introduce the the secret ingredient and the crucial ingredient, which is empathy, as you were saying in the beginning, Carl. Because ultimately it is all about empathy, our own empathy with our clients. And in fact, you could argue that the UX process starts from the very beginning. And when we're talking to the prospect, to the potential client. And if I may, I'm just going to say something that a, a student of mine said that was the best, best compliment ever, but that is a compliment to the process more than me. So basically they said that they'd done, they'd taken a business course, but that was very rigid and it was more designed to keep clients out, filter clients rather than get more clients. And it was just not quite right for him. And, but then putting into practice with his own clients, which is why I thought that it was really interesting, the UX concepts of empathy and of ultimately doing the best for your users, that's when he started really getting loads of clients on board because he completely changed his own mental attitude. And he started thinking, okay, what's best for them? Maybe I think that they should do a website like this because I think I know better, but let's give them what they want first and then maybe show them that you could do better, but ultimately make them make them feel listened to, because that's the main thing. Make it, and giving them agency and options, because that's what we were saying about the website that uh, drove us crazy this week. Um, it, it's for me it was about not having any options and not having agency. So even with our clients, that's a really good thing to do. So basically, he said that thanks to that course, he just picked up so like three clients in a week. And I was like, wow, because I never thought that that would be something that helps the business as well. And then I thought, well, I guess what it does. And I found myself guilty of not using empathy, looking at projects that I didn't get in the end recently. I was like, yeah, because that's because you wanted them to do what you wanted to do for right. them. And that's wrong. And so that's, um, that's, uh, that's empathy. But I, I empathy. I, I yeah. do want to ask if you have a, a, a definition you use to describe empathy, because like for me, uh, empathy wasn't a word I used uh, in everyday life until uh, I married a counselor who talks about empathy a lot because that's part of her profession. Uh, but even the it, uh, the theory of it and stuff is going to be the same in design or just uh, the general use of empathy. But kind of in this in this setting, what exactly are we talking about when we use the word empathy? So. Empathy is such an interesting concept. Now, as you were saying, in fact, there are different types of empathy and you don't always use the same type of, of empathy in every discipline. Now, the first type of empathy, empathy is cognitive empathy is when you understand how um, someone feels, you, you understand what uh, how are they're feeling, but that doesn't mean that you participate in it because an example of cognitive cognitive empathy is a psychopath they understand what makes the victims tick so that they can take advantage of it and hurt them so that's not you know it's not cognitive empathy doesn't necessarily mean that you're an empathic person in the positive sense because the positive sense is always like when you feel the feelings of someone else uh, and that's but for instance um emotional empathy could not be very helpful either because for instance if you're with a friend and they're crying about something and you feel for them so much that you burst out crying with them and you cry as much cry as much as they're crying you're not helping them out it's simply too much and and that's something that happens i mean i i get i get that sometimes i mean i, I can't go you know yeah, and i mentioned that also probably leads to a lot of depression if you're too uh, emotionally empathetic like the world we live in that would be too much to deal with right exactly and apparently it's a cause of burnout for um uh, first responders or uh you know, doctors in 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 uh, in uh, or war zones or reporters in war zones because you simply can't do anything. It's just too much. So, uh, cognitive empathy is what doctors must have because you understand the problem, but you don't get involved with it. 
And then there's the type of empathy that we should be using, which is compassionate empathy. So compassionate empathy is when you feel the problem, you understand it, you really feel it, but you also know how to get them out of the problem. So it's like, there's a Brené Brown, I don't know if you, mm. she's a she's a famous uh, therapist really. Yeah. And she says, go down, uh, there's someone down at home, uh, compassion and empathy is when you go down the hole with them and you give them a ladder to come out. Basically, that's compassion and empathy. So it's like when you understand someone's problem and you give them the tools or help them out of the problem. That's she has a really, what, uh, a really great, uh, like kind of TED talk thing that's on Netflix. Yeah. So if you look up Brene Brown, it's re it's really good. I recommend everybody check that out. Yeah. It's amazing. And then when you start thinking about things this way, you just go, wow. And I, you know, if I look at any of my home pages, I know that they're not about the user really, because I haven't, I um, want to do that. And the thing is, there are, I can see so many examples now of websites. I can tell immediately when a website is conceived for the user or, or if it's conceived for the business. It's amazing. And now I want to, I'm so excited about doing that instead and in fact going back to the creativity because i don't know whether you guys feel that but i feel that since doing websites i it's much less creative because it's much rarer to be asked unless you're lucky and someone says i need to do an online marketing campaign that needs a clever uh visual uh concept uh, which hasn't happened to me for a while then it's not create it's not my my type of creativity as when you do a book cover or a film poster, which is the best, or you know, things like that. See, I think we probably um, have different uh, different positions on this, just from how we are. Like, uh, we're both designers, and uh, we've both spent a lot of time designing. But you're an artistic designer, right? So you you can draw and do all these things that are very artistic. Whereas me, if you give me a pen and tell me to like draw a stick figure, I have a hard time. So I'm more of a designer in the fact that it's uh, putting a puzzle together, right? Um, so right. I think looking at that, I think you still get to be very creative, but you don't get to be the artistic type creative with web stuff. Where you Maybe you're right. It's a, it's a, yeah, that's a really good distinction. But I'll put you something else though. I think that when you start using UX, then you can be really creative. And it's uh, and that's what I'm starting to get really excited about. Like, say, for instance, that instead of um, if you're selling something on your website, like, for instance, let's say your uh, my course or your um, website owner's manual, if the landing page, instead of having the usual spiel, we know that people download it. If they think it's useful, they will download it. But instead of having that, if you had like a, a really fun quiz instead, so that it's something that takes a user by the hand where you want them ultimately, because you know uh, you know that for your uh, in, uh, a target audience, that uh, website owner manual is a godsend. Everybody loves it. So instead of just telling them that it's there, if you had something fun for them to do that gets them there anyway, but makes them feel really important because you've asked them questions, you put them at the center and you said you went, you found a formula, a way that's fun for them, but ultimately works for both of you. So Especially that if you way, can get I people to arrive really... at that conclusion on their own. That's a lot, exactly. uh, a lot better than exactly. selling to them. Exactly. I mean, there's a really simple example, which is uh, uh, two insurance companies. One, it's a new one. It's called Lemonade. I think it's US and Germany based, so you can get it. It's called Lemonade. And uh, they ask for your details in a really fun and human way. And I find myself like giving them my details like, well, like that. And then I looked at Aviva, which is a big, I think it's global, but anyway, the Aviva UK uh, website. And they ask in such a dry way. I was like, no bloody way am I gonna give you your de my details. I don't want you to have my details. Why would I give you my name? And the other company got me to give it. And I was like, wait a minute, I don't need insurance. And also, they're not in Spain, so I can't use them anyway. <laughs> but I, it was so fun to use it that I was like, okay, I'm using it. And another example that I make all the time, but it's still so relevant, is um, duolingo.com, which mm -hmm. is a language learning uh, website, and Rosetta Stone. Check them out. It's just, it's incredible how one is about you learning a language and the other one is about selling you software. 
it's it's amazing and once you start looking at websites in that way you could never do it you can never do that same thing again of just putting it to cta or you just don't do that anymore you don't want to do it and um and that's what i find really exciting and and i found the creative way into ux and i then take exception to the artistic thing because i think that we're all creative in that way because we all have to find solutions we can all get to that we just have to change our uh, mindset it's just a mentality shift and then you find a really clever really fun way to do it and maybe in that case animations may be useful <laughs> just as long as they as you there's also a button that says stop animations so that you can stop the animation but the animation always has to make sense but anyway maybe maybe it could it could help uh, you know so that's my my excitement one of the many reasons why i'm now really excited about ux but because well, the real create the opportunity there well, I do want to, uh, I want to give us a little bit of time here at the end so you can tell us a little bit more about your course, uh, which I know is fantastic, but I do want to ask two, th or I want to ask one thing and give one example here. Uh, so I think we've pretty much gotten the point of empathy across pretty well. What are, what are some easy takeaways people could have to try to approach projects more empathetic? What are some easy things you can do to try to come at it from that mindset? Right, so this is a really good question. Now, ask as many questions as possible, but always understand and know that you're never going to know because you're never going to be the, the other person. You will never be that. So I would recommend to always have someone look at whatever you create um, that is a new, someone that is a new, someone that, and that's even if it, it may not be the final user that you need to empathize with, but it's someone else that isn't you and isn't the business owner. So, and you can do that by using anybody that you have around you, your family, your friends, but also go and find those people because going at it in a more empathetic way is getting outside of ourselves, getting, uh, taking our own shoes off and putting other people's shoes on and even clients that say oh there's no way i can't find my users yes, yes you can there's a facebook book group for everything so you just go and ask anybody in any facebook there's everybody wants to help online go and find a facebook group that relates to your client's niche and say look would you mind using this website just you know just visiting this url don't even just tell me if you understand what it's it's selling that's one thing that i mean it this is basic usability testing, which is fundamental part of UX, but it's also a way of empathizing. And also make sure that maybe one of the people who use your website um, can see very well. Use someone who uh, can hear very well, because I am I'm beginning to uh, find out as the more I get into accessibility, which is a, an essential part of UX, the more, uh, for instance, I've recently found out that deaf people use the web in a different way. And you think, why, what's that to do? They can see, so, but yet they do because you, as I'm not deaf, I don't know what the disability does to you and it does things that you wouldn't imagine. But then also go out of your own culture group. So if you're, uh, you know, use people with different skin tones, a different gender as well. So all these things is how you use empathy because we make so many assumptions. Oh my God, I'm so guilty of that, especially as designers, because we think that we know better as we were saying earlier. So drop the assumptions, think you know nothing and listen to what other people say, even if they're not the, I mean, obviously final users are better, but when that's difficult, just get anybody else's point of view and don't take it personally. Because that's the problem with the clients. They want the logo bigger because they're so insecure and they take it personally. And we shouldn't ever take it personally, which is also hard, I think. Yeah, the, the thing I wanted to add to this conversation too, you led right into it, is uh, I think my, my favorite thing to hear is when someone around me, it's usually like my wife on her phone looking at a website, says, oh, this website is terrible. And it's my ears just perk up and I want to know exactly why. Like, 
why is this person having trouble with this? Because I want to figure out like, what has this other designer did? I mean, the website could be nice. It could be ugly. It could be new. It could be old. Uh, but what is causing this frustration for people? Because the more you can just look at those things, even being able to see them on websites or projects you had nothing to do with, you can start avoiding those things in your own projects, you know? So that's one of my favorite things to hear is when somebody's having trouble with the website, like, let, let me find out why that's happening. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think that that's, um, also it's, uh, the, again, the artistic side that wants to come out and makes you want to do really creative things that needs to shut up. You need to find another outlet for your uh, creativity. And uh, it's quite funny how whenever I see a website that's not very usable, you know immediately is that it was done by a creative designer who hasn't made the transition correctly. So they do something that is amazing to look at, maybe if you can, usually it moves, so I can't watch it. But but um, usually that's, those are the websites that don't work because you can't control them. Usually, right. I don't know what, what reason, what would you say that the reason your wife, for instance, gives you uh, is the more, you know, more often? Is that something that comes up? I, I think a lot of times it's just um, the the website isn't built that leads them to get to the destination they want. So if she's trying to buy right. tickets to something and you have to click through 15 different things to finally get to the park to buy tickets, it's really annoying. And I think uh, I agree with you, uh, quote unquote, designers that want to flex design muscles do this. And I think marketers are guilty of it, too. And they put so many marketing obstacles in between, like if we could raise conversions by 1% here and 3% here, and we'll add this pop up and we'll do all these things because it's going to make us a couple extra cent. Well, you're also frustrating a ton of people, you know, that are just completely that would have bought, but are completely abandoning the site because it's not worth it, you know? So I think marketers are pretty guilty of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, there's a really interesting other conversation or thought process to be had about marketing and UX because marketing and UX, funnily enough, have got lots of overlaps. A lot of the empathy techniques, the various types of interviews, the empathy mapping and other tools that you use are actually tools that you can use, that marketers use as well to get to their problem statement, to get to the uh, target audience, to get to the user uh, avatars, you know, whatever, you, personas, however you want to call them, they're very similar. But then where they diverge completely is where the marketers, you know, really strong arm the user in, in do, into doing what they want them to do. And again, Duolingo, Rosetta Stone, check those out. And that will give you the answer. So it, it is inside of your course where you kind of walk through the comparison of those two. Am I remembering that right? There's quite, a, there's quite yeah, but I've added to that because that was okay. the course that you took is the mini course, which is still available. And it's actually really, if I say so myself, but you gave me a glowing review, but it's a, it's a really good intro. It's quite, mm -hmm. it does give you a structure already and you could start using the process already just with a short course. Um, which used to be free, but it's not anymore. It was free for a for a certain period of time, and it's now. But it's only fifty seven dollars now, so it's not. It's not. It's, it's absolutely worth it. It is. It is. It opened okay. my eyes up and changed the way I did so many things. So I definitely. Where oh, can people check that it. that out? First of all, great. Um, but the the uh, UX for everyone long uh, called blueprint course that I'm calling is is much 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 bigger and uh it's um halfway through the release it's still it's available for sale uh at a still at a really low price um but it will go up because i am about to do probably in a month or so sorry if i'm, I'm being vague because i'm still working on the sales um plan um but it will go up because it's it's gonna be quite a big transformational course and but the main thing about it is also because th there's a like a blueprint co uh, course but there's also master classes and coaching course alongside that and that's where the real value is just to give you an example we're going to have um uh, jürgen strauss who's a marketer he's going to do a a master class on 
empathy mapping, which is one way to get not, not just to the user persona, but also to the definition of their problem. It's incredibly effective and he's going to do it live in a masterclass. Then we're going to get Paul Lacey to do a web personalization, which is, wow, it's such a, again, it's something else that you can productize and sell to your clients because that's also what the course teaches you to do. It's about the recurring revenue with all the optim optimization that you can sell, but all the upsells like web uh, personalization. I don't know how to do it. I'm going to learn it from Paul Lacey and I can't wait. And, and then Imogen Allen is going to uh, talk about the customer journey, which is all about how the brain works and how you sell. Then I will do, there are things that don't quite sit, fit quite in the course, but they're very relevant that will be parallel masterclasses. So I think the masterclasses and coaching course will be like more even, if not more valuable, as valuable as the course itself. And I get really excited about them because also what I can't wait to get to is the UI, because let's touch on that. We, we've got very little time left, I'm aware of that. But just to say that the user interface is part of UX in the sense that people need to use your website. That's where the usability comes in. If you've done your research well, you will, your task will be so much easier because you will know your audience already. You will know, for instance, the age group you're dealing with. If you know that they're above 50, you will not do small type, but actually while I'm here, never do small type, please just don't do it. Just don't do it. Or if you have to do it, then put a widget on there that allows me to make it bigger because I can't see and you're leaving many more people than you think, uh, you know, their money on the table. So anyway, I've so had to start zooming my browsers in and I feel like I might be getting old. Yeah, it's funny, like a week <laughs> ago, I, I texted Kyle and I was like, I just increased uh, like the font size on my phone for the first time. Oh, ever. you too, Matt. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I started really early. I, I lost my eyesight really, really early. And I think it's uh, screen proximity all day long because it, I'd always had really good eyesight. So anyway, it's it's um, th there's a lot more to it. So there's also basically UI is simply user interface. It's the visual design. And it sits on top of UX. And the course in itself is going to be too broad to do that as well in depth because it's another, in fact, it's the next course. The next course is going to be about usability specifically, which is mostly about the interface. But there is also a bonus module on the on the uh, on the user interface best practices. Because I can't do more than that. It's a whole new course. But um, so that's what UI is, and we all have to do it. Every we all have to create good UIs for our. And actually the, the UI is how you lead, how you make sure that your UX works because you lead the customer by the hand with that. Uh, well, yeah. tell everybody uh, how, how they can get to this course. I know we're running up against time here, so we'll, we'll put links yes. in here, but why don't you tell us a little bit how, how they can go check everything out and learn more if they're so interested. Go to designforgeeks.com that's where on the home page you're going to find a big button that will take you to the course then uh the you can watch um for the free the, there are free previews on academy.designforgeeks.com and then also if i may uh, mention my group mm -hmm. is that okay absolutely so in the facebook group design for geeks um there's also there's always conversations going on and we do also ux and ui reviews which are very helpful uh and they usually are at on the last wednesday of the month so i think by the time this is out it would be the last wednesday in november awesome. so yes that's how you can and always also if anybody wants to have a conversation with me about the course to uh, work out whether it's the right fit for them please get in touch on Facebook or elsewhere. I'm incredibly easy to find because there's only one peach and airy in the world. So please feel free to get in touch and we'll set up a, uh, a, a video call and I'll um, answer any questions. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, it, 
like she said, I took the uh, the mini course and I loved it. So I definitely think that's worth checking out. And I think you can get a ton from it. Uh, before we say goodbye, Matt, did you have anything we need to add to this? Um, boy, you know, the only thing that I would add, and it's it's a little off topic, but, uh, you know, when we filmed this, it's, it's zoomed in a little bit. And I did notice that you've got some pink on your shirt. Like what? Uh, what's going on there, Kyle? <laughs> oh, I, I got the. Oh, I got the right. That thing is fancy. This this is the one and only Daddy. on the back. It says uh, first customer ever" on it. Uh, so cool. I, I have it. to show this off a little bit. <laughs> so I think I'll just uh, yeah, I'll wear this every time we do a show. It's kind of like a mini endorsement. Right. So thank I you love for it. pointing that out. <laughs> look like a superhero right no doubt awesome well thank you so much pisha we we definitely appreciate you coming on again and i could probably have this you know continue this conversation a hundred more times and always get more out of it and i really appreciate you uh joining with us there's also going to be a 10 percent discount for uh uh tab um, ah nice before i forget because we nearly forgot that so uh yes and you get the codes and everything and all the awesome. links well, we will put all that in the show notes for sure. All right, guys. Well, as a reminder, if this group helps you in any way, the easiest way to help us is to share the content, subscribe to our YouTube or podcast and use our affiliate links. It's all free. It takes a little time and it greatly helps support the show. That's all for now. We will catch you all inside the group. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Hello and welcome to the admin bar. No, man, I just can't do it. This truck's bothering the crap out of me. He needs to move. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I we see... got the, uh, the little bit for the end of the, okay, of the me, episode now.